Oh, philosophy. <clears throat> the semiotic container of the potential known. That's my definition of philosophy. That's it. It's just a tool. It's a tool that's limited by the vehicle that uh, the tool operates within, which is essentially semiotics. <clears throat> when I get to that. The title of this, uh, you know, it's Frico Talks the News. It's just, I'm going to have to come up with a different name for these types of things, but uh, I'm not worried about it now. This is Words Kill Thoughts before they ever form. That's ultimately the point of this video. And it is going to be the underlying assumption that justifies to me in my own mind, just for me personally, my rejection of anyone that claims certainty using the 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 vehicle of of well the this isn't I'll just say the 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 tools that are potential within semiotic containers in general. So that is the whole point of this show. But I want to I want to give myself some uh we're going to start here. We're going to first well before I almost got a little ahead of myself. We got Sola Scriptura here. <clears throat> this is where we're starting from. Sola Scriptura by scripture alone in English is a theological uh, doctrine held by some Protestant Christian denominations that the Christian scriptures are the sole infallible source of authority for Christian faith and practice. <clears throat> in other words, that uh, God, <clears throat> in essence, although they would not think of it in this way, the entirety of the truth of his known is held within the framework of the semiotic. So, the Bible <clears throat> is in essence the semiotic container of the potential known of God. So that's what the Bible is. <clears throat> and the thing is, it's your only source <clears throat> of knowing who God is and what God is. Now, they make a distinction here that is worth uh, noting here. The sole infallible source of authority. Authority for Christian faith and practice. <clears throat> now, it's more than authority, really. It's about fallibility versus infallibility. And for the Protestant, Scripture <clears throat> is infallible. And uh, I'm not sure how many language theorists would uh, find any ability to hold on to <clears throat> such an assumption about Scripture in general. But that's, well, we'll get to that. And then there's uh, this, uh, let's, uh, let's take all the title now. I think we've uh, had that up there <clears throat> long enough. I'm going to keep that philosophy, though. Philosophy, the semiotic container, the potential known. I put philosophy in the overall, the, the, the umbrella, even, even religion, theology in, in, in part. Uh, well, theology is nested under <coughs> philosophy in my way of thinking, but that's another matter altogether, folks. Let's just stick with this. This is uh, this is from Squarespace.com. This looks like it may have been designed by the Holy Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church, because we start off here: the <coughs> one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Then apparently there were the seven ecumenical councils. Now I'm not sure if they're saying that there were some deviations during this time or not but then look immediately you get okay these <coughs> they begin to recognize a couple books is different uh, than than this <coughs> the one holy catholic and apostolic church 
And then these Oriental churches, Copt, Syrians, they may have some books that are different. And then you have trundling along here for quite some time until you get to Let's see if we can zoom. Ah, don't do this to me. Don't. <coughs> oh, I can't sling this over. I can't move this over. All right. Until you get to the Holy Eastern Orthodox Church down here, Catholic Church. So notice. They keep that name Catholic, by the way. Uh, by the way, the word Catholic, they never referred to the church as Catholic until, really until the Protestants start calling the papal Christians Catholics. The, the word Catholic, they used, they called themselves the Catholic Church, but not, like when we think of the word Catholic, we think of it as a denomination. Catholic it just means well, the, the universal church. <coughs> Ecumenical is worldwide. Catholic is universal. So that's all that means. And they would never have thought about themselves as the Catholic church. Now they do. They take in the name the Roman Catholic church. Is the Roman, they come from the line of uh, Paul, Paul, or excuse me, Peter. So that's why they call themselves Romans because they <clears throat> take their apostolic succession. Another reason why they call themselves apostolic. They have the, what they believe they're in the succession of... Uh, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so they have, the, they have some deviations, and then the, this, is, this is where the Protestants break off, and they have deviations. Suddenly they lose some of the books here. They lose some of the books here. And then we go back to Sola Scriptura and uh, the authority. Christian faith and practice. Scripture alone, scripture alone. God is only defined within the semiotic uh, container. To me, essentially, Christianity of this nature, sola scriptura, makes God a philosophy, but a philosophy that's limited by an interpretation of an aggregate of humans <coughs> into what connotes <coughs> the true books of the, of of scripture so you actually create a phil philosophically well maybe not i could argue but even like i believe i essentially use the uh <clears throat> by the or by protestant sense the orthodox protestant bible and i mostly follow that although i'm open to to reading certain things and uh, not open to reading certain other things because they have to align fundamentally with my understanding of the whole scripture. The most of the fundamental differences are in uh, between the Catholics and the <clears throat> Eastern Orthodox and the Protestants. Most of those di differences really have to do with <clears throat> books in the Old Testament. And even amongst Catholic Bibles, there were, or, or Protestant Bibles, there was a period of time where Protestant Bibles did include a lot of these books, these books that are not considered, they're not considered heretical, they're considered historical, <clears throat> like the, the Book of Enoch, maybe some people think that belongs in the Bible, and other, well, they don't consider it to be uh, heretical, they consider it to be historical, it's not the received word of God, but it is a solid book, so to speak, it's not treated as scripture, so there's differences like that as well. There's a lot of that stuff, and uh, all of it is within this uh, this uh, semiotics here. The study of signs and symbols and their uses or interpretations. And this really covers all the methodologies with which we communicate with one another. Let's see a little uh, break down here. We got semiotics, we have the symbol, the interpretant, the sign, the object. Extension reference over here. We have epistemology, just knowledge, idea, <coughs> relation, mind, the mind. So you have there here basically this is where the, the mind, the, the object is at the center. Here the mind is at the center. Here. So. I'm going to get to this because I want to give myself some <coughs> like. 
build up some standing with you, maybe. <clears throat> but uh, kind of let you know where I come from or where I came from. And, well, even in, in, in to a certain degree, how the se semiotic patterns that I was engaged in prevented me from making much broader connections about the world around me based upon what it was that I was internalizing. <clears throat> now this is uh, Academia EDU. This is Arc Speech and Sound Poetry. <clears throat> As Paul G. Collier Weidenhoff writes, in music, a solitary note is an illusion. One note consists of a series of expanding tones. The integrity or unity of this note is maintained by the motion of vibration from tone to tone. Motion, then, is the primary characteristic that creates the illusion of a solitary note. And then this writer adds, the illusion of a solitary note or a unified meaning is one aspect of an arc speech that is occasionally employed in various categories of music to emphasize either the aporic or confrontational aspects of sonic experimentation. Right? Check out the word aporic here. of pertaining to <coughs> Aporia. Alrighty. What is that? Alrighty. So let's go to Aporia. An irresolvable internal contradiction or logical disjunction in a text, argument, or theory. The celebrated Aporia whereby a Cretan declares all Cretans to be liars. So, let's listen. Aporia. Eporia. I learned a new word. Eporia. I, I did not know this word. This is so cool. Eporia. So there you go. I hope you learned this. So Eporia. I don't know if I will because that's a... Probably not. Maybe when I was 22 I would have uh, learned it quickly because I would have applied this to my poetry right away. I would have written a bunch of poems using this word. I would have explored... Yeah. <clears throat> An irresolvable... Internal contradiction or logical disjunction in a text, argument, or theory. The celebrated Aporia, whereby a Cretan declares all Cretans to be liars. Yeah. Get it? It's like the the, uh, the the statement on the other side of this card is true. The statement on the other side of this card is false. Kind of, sort of like that. Not, a, not exactly. So then there's this this thing here, and then semiotics, and then we get back to to this 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 quote here from Paul G. Collier Weidenhoff. Now this is uh, from an essay that was written back in I want to say 1994. And that was uh, it was actually published in more than just Core 38, which was Core. This was for like concrete, verbal, visual, experimental poetry. And uh, I am that person. This is me. The Fris Frico is, is this is me. This is the version of me. Uh, Paul G. Collier Weidenhoff. The illusion. Uh, yeah, I wrote that, and this has been quoted in more than places like this. But this is uh, just a, let's say this is written by Sean Braun, 2014, a Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies and Thoughts. <clears throat> this isn't the first time that this was quoted, uh, uh, this thing. Uh, I would say of all the things that I ever published, uh, even I ran a poetry magazine with a partner of mine and uh, called Logodedalus Magazine. And he, I publish poetry in numerous places, like here. You can find me in one of the few places you can still find me. I used to, I'm finding my, my, my stuff is disappearing, of course. Uh, I only really published in the 90s, and by 99, I was, I was done. I was no longer interested. And there I am, Paul Weidenhoff. Uh, 
<coughs> and I was published in Generator numerous times, actually. It was, uh, and also we published. Uh, uh, I believe is John Bennett is the editor of this. Does it have him there? I believe John Bennett is the editor. I'm the editor. All right. Okay, and and I've actually published a number of these folks as well, and I used to know. Oh, I don't even know what I remember of most of these folks, but I knew these folks. I was engaged in this world for a number of times, and during that period of time, things like semiotics were of a great uh, concern to me, and I I, I was uh, very much interested in in language poetry, and I wrote a lot of uh, language poems myself, and I still write in language poetry uh, type style here. Who is this? Uh, I don't even know who this is. Uh, poetry is an act of affirmation. I affirm I'm alive, that I'm alone, not alone. Poetry is a future, thinking of next week. But no, no, that's not really... Wait, that's not... This is... Let's see if we can get something better here. In developing their poetics, members of the language school <coughs> took us their starting point. The emphasis on, on method evident in the modernist tradition, particularly as represented by Gertrude Stein and Louis Zukowski, uh, two poets that I both, I love both of those poets tremendously, and I have written my own derivative versions of both of these. And by the way, Louis Zukowski's book, a book-length poem, big, big, thick book, you, you should get that book and read it. Read the hell out of that book. It's beautiful. Language poetry is also an example of poetic postmodernism. Its immense postmodern precursors were the New American Poets of Rubric, which includes the New York School, the Objective School, Black Mountain School, Beat Poets, and San Francisco Renaissance. Now, I'm not... I mean, I know about the Beat Poets and read some, and I don't really know that much about San Francisco Renaissance, but I do know about the Black Mountain School, the Objective School, I know a fair amount about the uh, New York School, um, but uh, these were these were all the types of worlds that I sw that I I, uh, I swam in. So let's see if here, if you get to the, I want to get to the theory. If you got the, okay, language poetry emphasizes the reader's role. Let's see how if I agree with them. The, re the reader's role in bringing meaning out of a work and came out about, at least in part, in response to something times uncritical use of expressive lyrical sentiment among earlier poetry movements to which language poets felt a kinship. Okay, now, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to go anymore with this, so I'm going to basically tell you my version, <clears throat> the way that I understood it in a way. Now, I came to language poetry <clears throat> really about maybe 10, 15 years after it really started. And really, I came to it kind of after its heyday. It started in the late 70s, uh, early, mid 80s, but still there's plenty of language poets for, that were still around, like Douglas Meserly was one of the, one of my favorite early language poets who was contemporaneous at the time and had, was also part of the early movement. Lynn Higinian, others, but for me, Language poetry was the notion that language itself was capable of creating its own. That you could be the vessel through which you allow language to be churned through. And initially I was very much interested in being the vehicle through which language could uh, create itself. Could create its own mythologies, if you will. And then I came, I guess I went back in time, in essence, and Duchamp kind of uh, led me out, not out of language poetry, it didn't leave me out of language poetry as a tool, uh, but left me out of language poetry philosophically, and it was the, 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 the methodology by which uh, Duchamp, and I've said this story on other shows and other versions, and I'll say it because I think it bears, one of these stories I think bears repeating the uh, bright stip uh, bear by her, her, her suitor, seven suitors, whatever it was, or suitors even, whatever it is. Uh, the uh, allegedly, uh, the it's a, it's a sculpture with a glass in front of it, and like uh, it's got uh, on the way to the on the way to the art gallery, the glass was struck, and and it was a fortuitous, I guess, break, and it. it it actually ended up finishing off the piece and then it's this uh, 
the notion of the art being uh, a, a container of the chaos and the random, if you will, but uh, within some degree of uh, potential for the human to attach itself to, if you will. That's a combination of the chaos and the order if you, in, in another sense. But I was more interested in the, in the former rather than the latter. And everything that I was studying, even as far as semiotics in general, and I'm reading Saucer and Strauss and people you know, in that language theory model, not really understanding even what, what conversation that I was actually dipping myself into without really a fundamental understanding even of the, of the context of the writers and their motivation. Just so many things that I was just not even interested in. All that I was interested in was what, what could give me the tools. So philosophy, language theory, what could give me the tools to create, to be an artist. This was my fundamental driver in my early 20s to uh, early 30s. My fundamental driver was, uh, was that. And then we have, uh, oh, I got here. Why did I put you here? So the language poets, sometimes spelled L-A-N-G poets after the magazine that bears uh, that name are an avant-garde group of or tendency in American poetry. They emerged in the late 60s and early 70s. In developing their poetics, members of the language school took as their starting point the emphasis or, on method evi evident in the modernist tradition, particularly as represented by Gertrude Stein and Louis Zikowski. Language poetry is also an example of postmodernism. Okay, while well, there's no such thing as a typical language poem, certain aspects of the writing of language poets became heavily defined within this group. Writing that actively challenged the natural presence of a speaker behind that text. Writing that emphasized disjunction and the materiality of the signifier in prose poetry, especially in longer forms than had previously been favored by English language writers and other non traditional and usually non narrative forms. Now, I want to say by the time I had come over to language poetry, the longer form was not the tendency. The tendency was actually short form. And I think in part because everybody was publishing probably a lot more magazine, a lot more university presses, I guess, I think that were publishing a lot more postmodern type language type poetries, but still needed to write them short poems. That's my theory. I mean, at least for me, it was one of the motivations why I wrote shorter language type poet poems for that very reason. And I, I knew many poet friends that could say the same. This was, this would have been in the, uh, basically the early, really starting about 90, 91 ish, somewhere around there is when I really started to publish poetry. And I think 94 is when I wrote the essay that has, that's my most published thing. It was published in multiple places. In, way, in places, even this, are published and or quoted in multiple places. It's the my most quote-unquote successful academic thing I've ever done. And I have, I, I don't have, I have an associate's degree, by the way. That's all. I'm self, mostly self-taught. Well, not really. Nobody's self-taught completely. But uh, my, 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 my learning comes through my uh, pursuit outside of the halls of academia. Language poetry has been a controversial topic in American letters from the 70s to the present. Even the name itself has been controversial. While a number of poets and critics have been have used the name of the journal to refer to the group, many others have chosen to use the term when they use it at all without the equal sign, while language writing and language-centered writing are also commonly used, and perhaps the most generic terms. I mean, what emerged from language poetry was uh, really complex and even to this day a lot of what you see even in your common arts and music and I mean I've seen what you end up seeing I'm not in this world anymore but I did at the time I saw I saw what was coming <laughs> because I was uh, I was so much uh, a part of it now we're gonna get to uh, shift a little gears here and now what all of that has shown you is that I have a, a, a significant background in the understanding of the phenomenon of language. Now, during this time, I wasn't looking at the existential questions that were associated with the pursuit of the theory of language. I wasn't extrapolating out, extrapolating it out to any kind of uh, 
epistemological sense of the term. It was purely an, an ability to create a new aesthetic. I was looking to create a new art, so I was looking for the cutting edge thoughts in art so that I could uh, get that grasp and go beyond it. And that was uh, common for a number of uh, poets, certainly during that period of time that I associated with and even my, my, my closest associates. So uh, we, you know, I would have studied, for instance, I would have, uh, I, I definitely studied Kant. I was definitely interested in the uh, noumenal world and a thing in and itself, but I was interested in the, in the poetic uh, aspect of that and the ability to, to, for me, it was a feckin' bed to imagine the potential of what is within that cloud that he created. And I had really not studied Picked at all, which is where we're going to get to. And there's a point to this, but uh, Kant created a wonderful uh, space for the poet to exist in the uncertain. That's fundamentally what I wanted. I wanted the, uh, the, the mathematical uh, beauty to be uh, enhanced with the, the lyrical uh, mess, if you will. And... Uh, my study, for instance, of uh, Kant, once I discovered the numinals, there was nothing I needed beyond that as far as a useful poetic tool. So I wouldn't have been, really, I would have glossed over Fick, or if I did, I would have been pissed at him right away. <laughs> I'm going to get to that in a second. This is the analytic synthetic distinction. And this is uh, first published Thursday, August 14th, 20, 2003. Was Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. An analytic sentence, such as ophthalmologists are doctors, has historically been characterized as one whose truth depends upon the meaning of its constituent terms and how they're combined alone. As opposed to a more usual synthetic sentence, such as ophthalmologists are rich whose truth depends also upon the facts about the world that the sentence represents e.g. that ophthalmologists are rich this is sometimes called the metaphysical characterization of the distinction concerned with the source of the truth of the sentence a more cautious epistemological characterization this knowledge is that the analytic sentences are those whose truths can be known merely by knowing the meanings of the constituent terms as opposed to having also to know something about the represented world so the analytical sought to expand its horizon to include the basically to to include all of the containers the semiotic containers essentially they, they were claiming the territory of semiotics and and putting it into a place where you could uh, <clears throat> you could know things by the terms of the sentence alone in, in, in a broader sense so you could end up saying ophthalmologist or rich is still analytical not synthetic you could claim that ground that's that's kind of where we're uh, going with this a posteriori knowledge is obtained through experience so that means Anything that you learn that gives you the knowledge that enables you to understand anything else. So that is the a posteriori that allows you to uh, analyze the world. You would have the knowledge that you obtain through experience, though. And then there's a priori, knowledge is obtained by analyzing concepts independent of experience. Independent of experience. So these are concepts that are beyond the known 
can you get into the thing in and of itself? Analytic versus synthetic. An analytic truth is one that is true by virtue of the meaning of the words themselves. All bachelors are unmarried males. They do not add to our knowledge. But it does require that you know what the word bachelors means in advance. Synthetic truths are true in virtue of the kind of experience we have. All bachelors are meth messy. Virtue of the kind of experience that we have. So, the words themselves can give us the meaning. Here we need the experience. So here, this is more the, uh, the ideational, if you will, and this is more the empirical. If I understand that right. Who knows? <laughs> Okay, so let's get into this there. The ap a posteriori is the empirical. The a priori is the transcendental. Well, together with the synthetic. Now remember what the synthetic is. Synthetic. The synthetic is the experience. Synthetic is this experience. Empirical, empirical. Synthetic is the experience. This leads to the empirical. This leads to the ideational, hypothetical. This is so. Here, this is analytical, a posteriori. So, a posteriori. Now, let's go back. Knowledge is obtained through experience. This is. We have the hypothetical. This is where we are analyzing, remember, analytical, and analytical truth is one that is true by virtue of the meaning of the words themselves. So we have in here the uh, capacity to analyze, and uh, we have uh, a priori, going back again, make sure we're getting this down, knowledge is obtained through analyzing experience. Uh, concepts beyond experience this is kind of that black box kind of area and yet within that we have the logical uh, what, what we can produce is the logical is the a priori the logical even the uh, the knowledge of the infinite for instance is 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 a priori there's, there's we can never experience the infinite for instance and then we get into this category which uh, before Kant I guess, well, I won't get into that. Never mind. Don't get too... This is already going to be long enough. I'll just... Uh, so, we have the synthetic here. And remember, the synthetic. This is... This is... I'm going to go back here because I want to use their words. Synthetic truths are true in virtue of the kind of experience we have. Okay? All bachelors are me messy. So, we got the synthetic here. And then down here we have, so the a priori, this is knowledge in and of itself, like outside of itself. This is the transcendental, the transcendental. Now, this is not, I won't believe this would be Kant's, would it be? Kant's reflective perspective on experience consisting of the logical, the empirical, the transcendental, and the hypothetical. Okay, so there we go. We have these. This is the way that we're resolving all this around. A posteriori, hypothetical, empirical. Now what Kant does is he creates a space, a justification, if you will, for the analytical and the a priori, the, the ideational, if you will. Um, but he also creates a huge unknown that limits the capacity of the human to justify finite action. He basically kills sola scriptura. So David Hume completely kills science and, and logic, and, and he leaves everybody dead with... Uh, uh, I mean, you're going to be nihilistic pretty quickly if you uh, go down David Hume, although David Hume himself was not a nihilist. David would, I would say. Um, of course not. Uh, but anyway, 
you have for David Hume, you have no space for this space, the a priori and the synthetic, the transcendental. This space does not exist. There is a space for a priori uh, and, and logical. And remember the definitions we got here. Let's get this. Uh, and then that analytical truth is one that is true by virtue of the meaning of word themselves. David Hume concedes this. He concedes this. But uh, he doesn't concede that there exists an a priori that uh, that uh, go back here. Synthetic truths are true in virtue of the kind of experience that he had. They have. that there is a place for the synthetic and the a priori. There is no transcendental space. There's certainly, oh, sorry about that. There's certainly no transcendental space that has contained with it anything that the human could uh, justify as being uh, anything remotely to pursue. But uh, uh, Kant said something to the effect of uh, I had to, oh, I can't, you know what? I don't remember the quote, but it's, it, I had to, it, it, the paraphrase would be essentially I had to create a mystical, a mystical space in order to save science or something. And never mind. Don't worry about it. I can't remember the quote, but what he did was, uh, he, he basically threw a fly, a major fly in the ointment that, uh, the problem was that he was the one who restored some semblance of the potential for certainty claims once again, but he didn't go far enough. Basically he didn't go far enough. Let me get into fix. Fick's dialectical idealism attempted unification of the theoretical and practical aspects of cognition that had been set apart by Kant. He did this by rejecting the noumenal realm of Kant and by making the active, indivisible ego the source of the structure of experience. From there, his dialectical logic led to the postulation of a moral will of the universe, a god our absolute ego from which all eventually derives and which therefore unites all knowing. Yeah. Now he's primarily remembered in German history for his, uh, I guess his, his, his version of uh, nationalism. But uh, as I was got addressed to the nation, whatever it's addressed to the German nation or something like that. Uh, let's uh, learn a little bit more about Fick. Fick, then, in all his various representations of the science of knowledge, and indeed in all his scientific writings, proceeds as follows. He states and calls upon his readers to verify it in co contemplation, that in every act of thinking there are two ingredients whereof neither one can be deduced from the other, but both of which claim equal validity. Just slow down here. So he states and calls upon his readers to verify it in contemplation that in every act of thinking there are two ingredients whereof neither one can be deduced from the other, but both of which claim equal validity. They're, 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 they're a needed contradiction, but they are an unresolvable one unresolvable conflict go back and make sure we're picking up on this that hence every act of thinking is a synthetical act embracing two opposites and that it is the sole province of philosophy to discover and explain how the synthesis is possible that is how it happens that we must in every act of our mind hold two opposites, in part related and in part opposed to each other. Now, Fichte created basically the notion of a, a dialectical godhead. Whereas uh, other philosophers before him 
uh, created a well they created a fatalistic godhead in essence they created a godhead that is uh, unknowable and therefore humanity has but to pursue the unknowable and to seek to live out a reflection of as close to a perfect uh, reflection uh, well in essence these philosophers I'll just say during their time their ultimate conclusion of uncertainty never got the light of day but there were other reasons why they were picked up and these were the philosophers that like a philosopher for uh, like picked was 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 borrowing from but he took their godhead that was used as well essentially he took their godhead and turned it into the justification for a completely empirical world in which even the understanding of infinity was known because we are in essence we are a, a dialectical element of the godhead itself the godhead is the perfect creation but as soon as the perfect creation well the, well not a perfect creation the godhead is not a perfect creation the godhead is an incomplete creation rather and the immediate uh, pursuit of the godhead is to understand what the godhead is and the godhead can only understand that by creating the other and we're a part of that dialectical discourse and thus he takes the the godhead that once previously was the justification for our understanding of existence and very i'm not going to get into all that but uh, uh but ultimately leads to a a fatalistic deterministic path that uh, limits the human engineers that's why these things were never picked up and it gives the human engineers an entryway back in and the entryway back in is by basically declaring that that uh that uh that fourth category, that a priori synthetic, that transcendental, that this is the, 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 the a priori. There is no a priori in essence. The a priori is, is in essence that, that part of the Godhead that is uh, within us, that, that equips us to know through experience. Because we are the Godhead, we also have within us the experience of the Godhead. So again our experience of mathematical calculations is uh is actually the godhead's experience of the creation if you will of the mathematical calculations through the creation of the other the dynamic or the parameters through which the other can even operate within if you will so all of that beautiful poetry that it would be for me uh, but uh, I would ultimately have rejected pick because I was not looking for certainty so if I, like I said if I would have uh, I, if I did uh, come across Pict I don't remember if I did uh, discover him I would have uh, spit him out and said I would have just said fuck you man no way fuck you I'm going back to Kant in a lot of ways once I discovered Kant I'm like I mean I did I did dabble into Nietzsche, but Nietzsche wasn't giving me any poetry, really. He wasn't giving me any uh, uh, any any type of philosophical conceit that uh, would allow me to... Uh, I mean, what he basically, in my mind, gave me, and I'm not sure I wasn't entirely right, was, listen, man, the world is a dick, and so you should just embrace your inner dick and be a dick. That's how I think I interpreted him, so... I didn't go much further with Nietzsche at the time. I have other, ver, uh, uh, I have other beliefs about Nietzsche now that are different. Again, because everything I read, everything I looked at was through this lens immediately. Because I had, I had paternal expectations of the world that I, that I pretty much demanded and didn't even realize. And that that was basically, listen, whatever pattern you want to feed me, what I want to see above all else is a pattern that I can use as a tool to inject into my own poetics because I was seeking through my poetics to be the uh, the magician and I was not trying to create certainty because magic is I always knew that magic was a trick and I always knew that I was pulling off a trick 
but the trick itself is uh, is is worth it, and, and and it's important that you never know the secret of the trick. So, so mystery is is ultimately what I needed to be the poet that I wanted to be. So, so I wasn't interested in I wasn't interested in Ficht for that for that if I would have found him. And Ficht, who well, I think I think I've uh, I've I've talked uh, a little bit more about that than I really need to. We learned what the word aporia means. Aporia. An irresolvable internal contradiction or logical dysfunction in a text, argument, or theory. Uh, the celebrated aporia whereby a Cretan declares all Cretans to be lying. Aporia. In rhetoric, the expression of a doubt. So we aporia. Can use it in a rhetorical sense. Aporia. I really hope. I hope I remember this word. I doubt I will. But man, I really hope so. I really love it. Aporia. I mean, that should be. I should. Oh my gosh. I should call these aporias. Because I think all logic ultimately becomes an aporias. And I'm not the only one. But that's another path altogether. And it brings me back to Solar Scriptura. And uh, why it is that I don't trust people that uh, speak with certainty about the nature of the universe in any way, shape, or form. Whether you're talking about God or whether you're talking about morality of any kind or you're talking about justice, diversity, equality, freedom, liberty, any of those words. And you seek to define with uh, certainty who and what we are and who and what we should be within within the semiotics the semiotic container of the potential known so my theory is that uh, language all of this uh, all of this to, to get to this that language itself it is the necessary transmitter of ideational power power by the way I define as simply being the ability to influence action so it is the uh, ideational in the sense that it, it, it exists within in within the, the minds I'll say abstract realm I may come up with a better term for that but I'll call that now at that now so language exists within it. It, it can't really escape it even though it is the words themselves are are undeniably influenced by every aspect of our potential epistemological experience if you will uh, so language does absorb everything around it that the human absorbs and but it yet it immediately cuts it off this is where the post-structuralist their critiques come from with Derrida, which I studied Derrida, but again, I was I was not studying the, pol the political ramifications of Derrida. I didn't even study politics. I, I wasn't interested in Marx. I wasn't interested in capitalism. I was interested in poetic theory and language theory because I, I just was was interested in aesthetic, almost purely aesthetic. So Derrida was an aesthetic pursuit, and Foucault was. Uh, I didn't get very far with Foucault at the time uh, because for I, I don't even know why. I don't know why it was that Foucault was like, eh, he bored me because he didn't give me an aesthetic. He, I think maybe Foucault became more political and maybe that was why. And, I, and may, maybe more epistemologically political and I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in aesthetic. Derrida, Derrida ultimately, and I didn't read him so much directly as I don't think if I tried to read him directly, I would have understood him, especially as I understand why he wrote what, how he wrote now. But, uh, uh, but I was interested in, in basically the notion that language is always, as he would say, a lie. Every time you speak, you lie and you immediately kill thought in a way you kill the potential of what can be known between humans. But also it is the, uh, it is a necessary container that we find ourselves stuck with, if you will, the semiotics of the world. And it is, uh, it's all we got <laughs> for now. But I know that I have experienced and may, 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 maybe 
maybe this isn't all common maybe this is rare maybe this is really common uh, my suspicion is it's really common I have experienced thoughts that come at me in a burst sometimes I get these thoughts that come at me in a burst and it'll take me five six seven eight nine ten whatever hours fifty hours two weeks three weeks sometimes two years sometimes still working on them still working on them all of these things are true for me my whole philosophy that I'm developing called action botza which means base action base but it's basically base of action it's Latin so it's base of action uh, my whole philosophy is based upon uh, a sudden epiphany that I had while I was listening to a show called The Freedom Fiends in which I thought about the nature of uh, competition and it was this instant flash in which suddenly I knew and the world was totally different from that point on and I don't even remember if it was because of something they said on the Freedom Fiends or what it was I don't even remember but from that moment on and this is, I, I want to say 2000, maybe 2007, 2000, 2015 to 2016. It would have been early 2016 because it was before things really started getting crazy. Maybe, and you know, I think it was uh, maybe probably 2000 mid mid 2015 if i had to guess somewhere summer 2015 if i had to guess somewhere around there and, I, and, it, and it changed everything and then i began the task of trying to express not just to everyone but even to myself this epiphany thought that i had in my head and it was basically it was about the uh, or the phrase that came into my head immediately is a phrase that's still fundamentally a part of my philosophy and at one point Early on, it was essentially how I described myself, reality of powerist. And that was the phrase, reality of power. And it was my quest to understand the world based upon my understanding of reality of power. I wanted to understand the reality of power. And ultimately, what it led to me to was at its root is the question of uh, why do humans act? And then... When I thought about that question, why do humans act, I began to question all these philosophies and what their fundamental questions are. And Their fundamental questions are what is truth, and they're seeking to find it, and their definition and, and whether they're pursuing what is truth is in the nature of uh, what we can understand or uh, what might actually be. It's It's... It's about trying to find a justification for action within the construct of some moral foundation. Philosophy in the hands of, of those that have the power to engage in this discipline is mostly, it's, a, it's the semiotic container of the potential framework of a plausible deniability. <laughs> I had good intentions. That's why I killed all these people. Because look, 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 I was really pursuing liberty. Look at how I expressed it here. Look, man, it's what we knew at the time. That philosophy is essentially in the hands of of the folks that already have and want to keep what they have philosophy the, the philosophical voices that, that, that form the fundamental trail of philosophical thought but it's all mostly based upon the, the ones that provide the vehicles of power that justify killing uh, human it, well, independent human action in the name of uh, a declaration of the certainty of the known. This is why ultimately I'm not Sola Scriptura, because Sola Scriptura to me 
is to I, I mean I, I just know whenever I look at why it is that there are now some there are most of the apocrypha when I've looked into it for various reasons and I don't have I can't quote text and this scholar I'm not not so gifted I guess but I've looked into this stuff in, in great detail in various parts of my life and on the main I found there's a lot of stuff that was easy for me to go oh yeah, yeah, yeah I mean even if I just read the stuff itself it's like oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. nope nope and then uh, then there were uh, other things that are like oh no when it came to why it is that certain books are in the Bible that uh, the Eastern Orthodox have or don't have and then there are some other differences where I just for me my understanding of the nature of the Godhead and I'll I am I'll confess I am a Christian uh, I believe in Christ and and I I basically follow the the Orthodox Protestant Bible I don't I don't cons I don't really use the Orthodox I don't use an Orthodox or a Catholic Bible and I don't really feel like I want or need to necessarily in and of itself although I would like to read for other reasons but I'm happy with my Protestant Bible on the main but I have a, a pragmatic understanding of the of the uncertainty of the certainty of my thoughts regarding the nature of what is or is not in the Bible. I have some certainty and uncertainty regarding which translations of the Bible would I trust to be more faithful to the original than others, which has more of agendas and less of agendas, and you can even find significant translational decisions that were made in the forming of the King James Bible that, that were intended to continue to legitimize the authority of the central church coupled with the king in the way that the, the priest <coughs> and the king worked together to create a close priest-king model. You had, you had two entities that were, were the priest-king and every once in a while you would have someone that would attempt at least to fulfill both roles but largely you had two somewhat you had some I guess in a way you could say it's better than having one priest king so there was at least some degree of checks and balances because they had different interests so in a, in a way it was more democratizing than the one priest king so it's an improvement it's progress if you want to look at it that way uh, but uh, these were the folks that uh I mean, for years they defined Christianity a certain way, and uh, based upon their own definition of the certainty, the 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 infallibility, in in and for for a lot of folks during this period, Sola Scriptura comes in the Protestant era. For a lot of folks during this period, uh, the Sola the the infallibility for the Protestant rests only in Scripture, and Sola Scriptura really emerges as a shield. It gives people a fun, a really, a, a really powerful ideation, a vehicle of power uh, to 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 give themselves legitimization to not. I don't believe that. In uh, certainly, initially, uh, definitely, Martin Luther did not intend on people using sola scriptura as a, as a justification for taking violent action against the uh, Catholics. But so, sola scriptura is born from. Uh, taking the authority away from from the Pope because the, while they did not have Sola Scriptura they did have <coughs> Sola Popa the infallibility of the Pope and uh, those that were uh, claiming the authority of the Pope whether they had it or not it doesn't matter whether you perceive they had it or not it's all that really matters perception is ultimately all that really matters so long as it can fundamentally deny reality if reality can contradicts its uh, statement but uh, a wide girth there for perception to deny reality so you have the capacity to have your alleged uh, Pope authorities but be that as it may ultimately it comes from this uh, ideational ve this vehicle of power uh, the notion of the infallibility of the Pope rather than the infallibility of scripture and I am arguing against the infallibility pro process for everything even for me as far as my faith is concerned I do not grant that I am infallible in my assumption that Christ is Lord I, 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 I give space for the uncertainty of my claim now I tell you the truth when I say well as near as I can 
observe it within my own head. I tell you the truth when I say that uh, for me, the thing that I am most certain of is that Christ is Lord. That's the most certain thing in my life. Second most certain thing is that I exist. He's one and two. And neither one of those would I claim uncertainty. That what I deny, there is not a measure of uncertainty about either one of those. So that's where my belief in Christ ranks. But yet, even though it ranks at the highest of the highest, there is still, there is still, I, I, and, and in part, I allow that space in part because of, uh, well, because of Job. Is it, is it, I want to make sure I get the right thing here. I don't want to embarrass myself here because I do have uh, a leaky brain so to speak. Let's see if it's Job 27. I'm not sure if this is... Okay. You know, this is not it. Let me go Job 28. Ah, oh, here we go. Maybe I should leave you with this. This is a good place to leave. This is this is this is uh, in in part my my uh, my beginning is the the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord in 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 a civic uh, sense out, outside of the parameters of uh, of the uh, ontological, so to speak. Uh, in the civic sense, uh, when I talk about the fear of the Lord, fear of the Lord is uh, basically it's a it's a, it's a knowledge of your own wretchedness and brokenness and your necessity for uh, others around you to, that have compassion and grace and mercy that uh, begins your understanding of the, the true nature of the world, the reality of power of the world. The reality of power is we're all broken pieces of human crap. All of us. That means in a sense none of us are, but in a sense still all of us are, and that means that... Uh, and because of that, uh, we require consensual exchange. This is, it is, it is our, it is our inability to know. It's our inability, our deficiency, and our comfort with that inability and deficiency, that that equips us to be consensual in in our nature. And this is. This is the warning to Job. This is at the end when his friends have been basically saying, listen, you're uh, you're suffering all of these losses. You, you lost your wife, you lost your kids, you got all these terrible, horrible inflictions, you got boils all over your body and all that. That's because you weren't righteous enough, man. You're, you Listen, dude, there's no way, there's no way that God, God is good. There's no way that God would allow this crap to happen to you. So therefore, you must be a piece of poop. And, uh, and, and, and this is... Uh, and then this is in part his response, but uh, yeah, this is why I think Job existed. This is he, he he speaks to us beyond and 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 well, I'll get to that at the end here. So there is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft. In places untouched by human feet, far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Lapis lazuli comes from its rocks, and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows that hidden path. No falcon's eye has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it, and no lion prowls there. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all its treasures. They search the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not me. The sea says it is not with me. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought with the gold of Ophir, with precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be held had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention. The price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of Kush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. 
Where does the wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our eyes. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he establishes the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. And then we get the... Uh, let me show you. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here we go. Oh, by the way, I talk about translations. As far as translations go for me, in general, I look for the ESV. I trust the English Standard Version. So we can get into... Uh... The way of wisdom. Wisdom has built her houses. She has known her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young to women to call from the highest places to the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks scent, she says, Come, eat of my bread. <clears throat> Drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of wisdom. Or she's in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who repeals a wicked man incurs injury. Do not repeal a scoffer or he will hate you. Repeal a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning, the beginning. This takes it one step further. And this is written by Solomon, the wisest by Christian belief system. And mine, uh, the wisest human being that will ever exist in the world. And the knowledge of the Holy One is in sight. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it beginning of wisdom wisdom and we want to be able to insight this is, this is the beginning of wisdom this is the beginning of the journey right here this is when you come and again within the civic you come to know what a piece of poo poo you are and here the knowledge of the holy one is insight for me the knowledge of the holy one is I understand it fundamentally the knowledge of the holy one is in the living of the of the holy one's way so to speak which I think is fundamentally articulated when Christ says and uh, is it John chapter 16 or, you know, John chapter 16 All right, uh, he says uh, he says to his disciples this is uh, this is after he's come back from the dead so or, 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 or excuse me this is, this is right when he's about ready to uh, <laughs> the very opposite about ready when he's about ready to be uh, taken John chapter 17 is uh, one of the be be uh, well pretty significant chapter in the Bible for me and that is his his love letter where he is about ready he's in the garden of eden and he's he's con i mean the garden of gethsemane and he's contemplating what he's about ready to to take part in experience and before that in john chapter 16 he tells his disciple that uh i give you a new command now i believe theoretically i believe it replaces it it gives the spiritual meaning to love one another the golden rule that's the letter of the law the spirit of the law is to love one another as i have loved you and christ's model of love is well you read the gospels and you'll see the model of love, as i would interpret it is uh it's it's a life of uh of service of seeking to lift others up and uh, the purpose of lifting others up is ultimately edifying mostly to yourself they, the people you are lifting up can never 
experience what it is that you experience in the joy of lifting them up in that and this is con the root of consensual the, the closer you can get to your body giving you all of the uh biofeedbacking within that makes it easy for you to choose consensual exchange fundamentally uh the more valuable you'll be to me i don't care how you get there i mean ultimately christ as lord is uh, it's not i wouldn't say that it's how i got there but i will say that uh my path of getting there has has certainly not uh impeded if anything it strengthened my faith so uh but it didn't emerge from my faith I'm, well i think ultimately everything emerges in, in essence from my faith but it didn't emerge with an in an observational sense it did not emerge from my faith it emerged in a in a pursuit of civic understanding of and I'm still in, and, and that's what Action Bots. Action Bots is not Christian theology. Action Bots is a, is a, is seeking a civic understanding. When you strip away, you you take the Godhead out of it. This is what science is. Science, to me, science. You're observing God's laws, but you're stripping God out of it, and you don't need God to understand His laws, so to speak. And so, in, in essence, for me, you don't need uh, Action Bots is is a description. That you don't need to believe in you don't need to believe these are god's laws it, it, and it, it has a it seeks a justification for its assumptions in a civic sense without a foundation of god as its claim its foundation is basically that uh, all human beings overwhelmingly are are incredibly vulnerable and needy and uh that's the fundamental assumption and it more human beings would understand that they would see that systems that emerge from consensual exchange offer significantly more humans significantly more opportunities to live lives of their own choosing than all other forms and unfortunately our history is filled is cluttered with all other forms in large part thanks to the the semiotic uh, games played by philosophers that seek consistently to keep us penned in by our own words to use our own words words that are intended to empower humans well you could argue that evolutionarily they would have they would have emerged and been preserved if they preserved humans initially uh, and so you could say initially they, they they enabled us to to work as a group better probably so they facilitated greater human uh, understanding and then at some point they move from facilitating greater human understanding to uh, to uh, uh, basically enslaving ourselves to it so fict for instance fict is essentially the desperate attempt to preserve <coughs> the certainty of uh, Kant's uh, analytical uh, um, uh, a posteriori so that uh, <coughs> they could kill the uncertainty that Kant created with the noumenal world and without that uncertainty you could once again have the ideationalists arrive to say and ultimately see see that's the thing I think go to me this guy this is like the, the you know the contradiction the, the contradictory uh, where, where is that word again get to that uh, here uh, in and of itself it becomes uh, an aphoria an, an irresolvable internal contradiction or logical dis disjunction in a text argument or theory because uh, you're, you're ultimately you're starting with a, a proposition that everything is empirical because of uh, Godhead that you are <laughs> in conversation with the rest of the world and in a process to know who you are so to speak but it becomes so so interdependent upon that internal definition of the certainty that justifies everything else that it ultimately becomes ideational again and this is ultimately i think why Fick becomes such an important figure to german idealism 
because ultimately his empirical extreme kind of sort of leads back to I mean it's it's what happens it's what happens and that's the nature of the world that's the nature of uh, logic and reason in general ultimately ultimately it really is about uh, coming to an understanding of your own wretchedness and your wretchedness of everyone else so that you don't put yourself in a subservient role to them that's important if you just leave it at your own wretchedness then you're crippled it's like why 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 they say they don't say majoritism and majorityness when they talk about uh, uh, the phenomenon in America that has disadvantaged other groups of people. Instead, they couch it in, in divisive, uh, sub generalizing, subhumanizing words: whiteness and, uh, and white privilege. So that, they're not seeking to build bridges and to build consensual exchange between groups right from the start. They're creating hierarchies of assumed value in the language that they speak. Needlessly so, if they were truly doing what they claimed they were ostensibly doing. So again, they're just doing what philosophy does in general in the hands of those that already have, which is they use semiotics as a... Uh, a clever uh, magic parlor trick to convince you that there is possibility that they can justify the murders that they're committing because they can absolutely know and everybody else should be able to absolutely know if they weren't part of the evil uh, that this is all is for the good of the whole and that's the most important thing so I think I will end this at this I think I might do one of these uh, maybe once or twice a week where I pick a topic that has been churning in my head and talk about it and sometimes I'll talk about a topic again if I've talked about it before if I've made some significant changes so I might not be done with this but I will say this I'll leave you with this when I was a young man when I was a young man I wrote something which I actually used as a uh, uh, the backdrop. Hold on. Let me type this. I wrote invented by adults perfected by I just want to see if there's there was a time when I typed this up in one of my poetry magazines was showing because it was available somewhere I forget how but I don't know if it does anymore let's see the invention of language by children no interesting no so it doesn't come up anymore but uh, used to long time ago language invented by adults perfected by children I have more to say about that but uh this has been an uh, underlying assumption in my life since I was in my early 20s. And it's, uh, it's, it's, the, the, it's the understanding of the fluidity of language. And uh, this part here, perfected by children, I was more right than I thought, but I was looking at the innocent, uh, creative way that, that uh, what, basically you're, 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 you're the next generation is going to come along and immediately uh, recognize the, uh, the the labors and the inefficiencies and cut off the chaff and and then insert into it the new that expresses what is unique to their experience and so that'll go on and out as the flow that's basically why I express but uh, I really uh, even though I understood it at that time to a certain degree I understood it a lot more the, 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 the language language is how those that have continue to contain you within boxes that allow them to make you more what they want you to be rather than giving you the space to be what you actually might have you won't even discover in your lifetime what it is that you might have actually wanted to have been if you had had have a chance to really ponder such things and unfortunately in this world and throughout most of human civilized history significant vast majority of us never got that i did get that chance i'm one of the very lucky few in america we have a much higher percentage of folks than most other places of the world and so at the end of the day i hope i leave you with us remember remember anyone that speaks with certainty is already lying to you because they're speaking to you in the semiotic 
container, and that semiotic container is inherently flawed and incapable of expressing the 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 I I would I believe the the sheer complex intellectual capacity of the human mind alone in in expressing itself to others like i said even action bots i'm i don't i don't know 4 years into it still i think i may have another 10 years ahead who knows i'm still not there i'm definitely can talk about it in a lot more ways than i could but uh still that flash there are things there are flashes that uh, i'm sure that you've all understood your language it limits you in being able to express if we could ever find a way to communicate in which those flashes could be transmitted to others and we could hear and see their flashes well uh, our our understanding of who and what we are would grow just probably more than ever we could if we had all of the quantum computers of the world operating all of the most complex ais that are also working in unison with our traditional binary computers as well and all that uh, you, none of it would compare with what humans would be capable of doing amongst themselves if they ever could get to that place that's that's far more of a place to dream about than to allow ourselves to be limited by these uh by these hackers off of the potential that is so much more magical and uh self edifying i'll say the the space that exists in the unknown as opposed to the certain claims of the known and with that i'll say have a have a great rest of your day because uh why the hell not